Hello guys, uh, last section of this exam, exam number uh, four. Okay, after this, we have one exam and then the final is going to be uh, over the last uh, set of materials and I will let you know uh, what is in the final. So anyhow, let's start. Uh, mollusks, so as you know, we've been talking about them a little bit here and there, uh, mollusks from beginning of semester that uh, they are, <clears throat> if you would, they are the, uh, I can make my space a little bit smaller. Uh, they are like uh, uh, clams, snails, uh, uh, octopus. So these are, they're silomate animals. We'll learn rest of them now. They're silomate animals and they, uh, they have mesenteries, of course. Uh, mainly because the mesentery surrounds the coelom. Uh, they're protostome animals, you know that from beginning of semester, mouth first, uh, spiral cleavage, true organ systems, gas exchange through body surface and gills. Uh, the ones that are aquatic, they have gills. The ones that are on land, they have uh, lungs. Uh, open circuitry system, uh, but most cephalopoda have closed circuitry system. And you know, I already talked about closed and open circuitry system, but quickly, uh, the closed, here we go, closed circuitry system, if this is the heart, the blood is always inside of a vessel. Of course, you know this, we talked about it uh, from uh, capillary, from um, aorta goes to uh, artery, arterioles, capillary, venules, vein, uh, and then back into the heart. Open circuitry system, something you have not been exposed to, already talked about it. So, so the organisms have a heart and then they have the artery, which takes the blood away. Here is heart, here is artery, takes the blood away. And then the arteries end up into eventually to a set of sinuses, right? We call them sinuses. Okay, end up into sinuses, and then the blood from the sinuses, which are the openings, that's what they call it, open circuitry system. The, these opening from sinuses, the blood goes back into the vein and into the heart. Okay, so if this is sinuses right here, these openings, then you have the cells of the liver, the cells of the brain are right here. So blood comes and percolates around them, and then it goes back into the uh, vein and to the heart. Uh, how about in closed circuitry system, you remember you have capillaries. You had capillaries and the cells of the body, if you would, they were surrounded by capillaries, okay? That's the difference, okay? So anyhow. <sighs> Uh, cephalopoda are the largest invertebrates on land. So as far as we've been studying invertebrates after the first exam and everything in there, uh, we've been taught, well, except protista, um, we started with sponges. And then after that, the jellyfish, and there are some huge jellyfish uh, in the sea, but there are uh, um, uh, other mollusks like giant squids or, or uh, or some octopus, they can be uh, humongous as well. But anyhow, are the largest invertebrates. They have eyes for the first time. We've been talking about eyes all the way from uh, flatworms. Remember uh, planaria at eye spots? Uh, we've been talking about eye, but none of the eyes we've been talking about so far, uh, they can form image. The eyes of these organisms they can form image, okay? The eyes of octopus, the eyes of um, squids, um, uh, and so on and so forth, they can form image. So, not all of the species, uh, but some of them, they can form image. Okay, and they have, what is this, the mass taking? I cannot, I did it. Up there. Uh, Annelids and mollusks had a common ancestor, possibly uh, again because of the uh, coelom and then uh, because of the larval stages, or they have similar larval stages. Okay. 
uh, no metamerism. Uh, they are not divided. Uh, they do not have body parts like uh, uh, analytes we talked about, like uh, um, chordata, like us, or like ma um, arthropods. Okay, so they do not have uh, metamerism. Adaptive radiation, that is something we have not talked about it yet. It means, what does, I'll show you a picture, and but quickly, it means they had a common ancestor here, and then they evolved, they went to different environment, and they became successful. They lived on in those environments, different type of environment. For example, deep sea, on land, in the shores, in the lakes, in the rivers. So they are in all different type of environment, and they thrived. Okay, that's what adaptive radiation, and they came from a common ancestor. And you see a diagram, I will talk about it. One of the largest animal kingdom uh, after arthropods. So if I had to, in the final exam, I had to ask uh, which of the following is not the large, is the least law amount of least number of the organisms in that phylum. For example, I give you arthropods, that's number one, mollusks, number two, nematodes, number three, and then tenophora. You know, tenophora, the comb jellyfish, very small phylum. Okay, so the least phylum, it would be tenophora among the choices. So, but the top three, and I don't know the fourth one, who would be the fourth one? It's up for the grab, but the top three are arthropoda, mollusks, and nematoda. You have not studied arthropoda, that's the next exam but you study number two and three, save the best for the last. Huh? Have you heard of that? <laughs> so arthropods is for the next exam. Only bivalves and gastropods move to the shallow waters and fresh waters, and most intelligent of invertebrates are cephalopoda, okay? And uh, coelom is limited to heart, uh, some gonads, and parts of the body. Body contains a head foot portion and visceral mass, of course. Here is the, that's what I was talking about, you guys. Uh, this is adaptive radiation. If you look at it, they had a common ancestor, and the common ancestor, the organisms evolved to uh, polyplacophora, which we are going to study that, scaphopoda, and uh, bivalvia, and cephalopoda, and gastropoda, and monoplacophora. Of course, these are the classes I will talk about. I will not talk about these two classes, okay? I'm not gonna talk, say anything about those two, uh, but those are the classes that we do have specimen from them, except monoplacophora, we do not have specimen from them, but we have class, uh, we have specimens from these five, the uh, polyplacophora, scaphopoda, bivalvia, cephalopoda, and gastropoda. So that is adaptive radiation from common ancestor, organisms evolve into different environment and they thrive in those environments. Okay, a few things about shell. Uh, the, the, uh, there are three layers into the shell. Periostracum is the most outer layer. It's made up of protein molecules. The very outside layer uh, is uh, periostracum. The next layer is prismatic, very thick and it's made up of calcium carbonate, okay? And then the in most inner layer right here, that would be your nacreous layer, which is shiny still and made up of calcium carbonate, but it's shiny, it's bright, and so on. You can see it, any of you grab the shell, you look at it, you saw it. Radula or radula, either pronunciation is correct, radula or radula. You have not seen it in any other phylum so far. Okay, for example, shell, you have seen it a little bit like uh, in, uh, in uh, four aminophorans, radiolarians, you remember that from uh, Protista a long time ago, but um, you have not seen shell, you have not seen radula in any of them. So what is radula? Radula, the pattern and the numbers are different from different species and they use that for classification a little bit sometimes. And then they are found within the mouth uh, I, I saw you, and the function of radula is rasping tongue-like 
organ except the bivalves. Bivalves do not have radula, and then the muscles move radula and serves as a conveyor belt. I don't know, you've seen it in any factory. You've seen they put, you know, in a factory, in assembly line, there is a conveyor belt and it moves. When it moves, it brings the, the, the laptop to me and I do a few things to the laptop and it's constantly moving. And that's what conveyor belt is. Okay, so the, it's like a conveyor belt, it moves and bring food um, to the mouth of the uh, organism. Here they are, uh, the radula, showing you the radula. Uh, we do have two different radula uh, as far as the microscopic slides goes in the lab. Make sure you do uh, know them. And it's showing you, uh, this is the mouth part and the food, it's just like a conveyor belt. It moves around and bring it to the mouth. Uh, to the stomach, it goes to the stomach. Okay, foot uh, is used for locomotion, attachment, and combination of both. Hatchet foot in bivalve look like a hatchet, look like this, and then we'll talk about it. Um, siphon, uh, you know, outside of the foot, there is incurrent siphon and excurrent siphon. Incurrent siphon brings food, yeah, water, and food, of course, in the water uh, to the uh, to the mouth part. It's uh, as I said. An excurrent siphon will uh, take the waste out. It uh, secretes mucus, uh, of course, in food, uh, like in uh, snails, the foot. And then uh, that mucus is used for adhesion and spinal tract, which you've seen it in. Uh, this is the one that I do have problem with. Oh, okay. Not now. Okay, great. Uh, visceral uh, portion of the body what is in the uh, uh, body of these organisms. Oh, yeah. yeah, this, okay. Uh, mantle and mantle cavity. Uh, mantle is like skin and the mantle releases, uh, it makes the um, shell of these organisms, skin of shell, secretes the shell, and mantle cavity houses respiratory organs. Uh, also, mantle itself acts as a gas exchanger as well. As I said, uh, products from digestive, that's what I meant, very important. Uh, products from digestive, excretory, and reproductive system emptied into the mantle. And I'll show you a picture. So mantle cavity, not into the mantle, mantle cavity. Mantle cavity is an area which you will find if you open up these uh, organisms the, the digestive material from there, excretory material, reproductive material, all can be in there and you see it in the uh, picture. Current, a counter current exchange mechanism or multiplier. You've seen that in the kidney, human kidney, I already talked about, well, I didn't go to details of it, uh, but you've seen that term and that's why I mentioned it when we were talking about kidney that, um, but in these organisms, uh, the counter current me uh, exchange mechanism, the water goes this way and the flow of the blood goes that way. They go opposite of this way, opposite of each other. When they go opposite of each other, then the food and nutrient and oxygen and all of that can be absorbed. Okay, and you will see a picture of it here in a minute. Cephalopods use head as a mantle cavity to create jet propulsion in these organs. Some internal structures, uh, heart, blood vessels, blood sinuses, remember that, blood sinuses, if you remember talking about that, those are uh, the, the openings that the blood goes into and exchange of gases and nutrients occurs between the red blood cells of these organisms, the blood cells of these organisms, and the uh, cells of the brain, liver, muscle, whatever happens. Okay, cephalopods are hard, uh, cephalopods have hard blood vessels and capillaries. Um, they do not have um, open circulatory system, they have closed circulatory system. The whole phylum is distinguished to have open circulatory system. However, within this phylum, cephalopoda, octopus, squids, nautilus, they do have closed circulatory system. Okay, A pair of kidney. Metanephridia, nephrostome, and silomic area. Ducts of kidney may uh, also serve as discharge of the eggs and sperm, which you've seen it already in other organisms. A nervous system has a neurosecretory cells, 
and advanced sense organs, like as I said, advanced sense organs, it would be like the eye. So that's an advanced sense organ. So they can see the image, they can uh, form the image. I'm sorry, I always had these problems with these PowerPoints uh, throughout the semester. Okay, great. Um, so what is this one? Life cycle and reproduction. Let's talk about the, uh, this is the general uh, characteristics of the phylum. I'm talking about the general characteristics of the phylum. It will come up. So uh, talking about life cycle and reproduction. So uh, most of the species are monaceous. There are some uh, uh, dioecious here and there. Uh, if this one comes up. I don't know why these glitches are with my uh, PowerPoints. Okay. I cannot even. Okay. I guess I have to do it from bottom. Uh, Dioecious and some hermaphroditic, I talked about that. Choco for larva. Um, it's a larva that uh, is similar to annelids. We talked about that before, so that's possibly uh, they evolved. Um, it had a common ancestor with analysts. Direct metamorphosis. I mean, the life cycle does not change. In many gastropods and bivalves, a uniquely molluscan intermediate larval stage is called the villager stage. It's hatched with the beginning of the foot and shell and the mantle. Okay, what a villager is, a villager is, it look like, it's a microscopic, it look like adult uh, bivalve, okay? So when it look like adult, you see a picture of, in the lab, you will not see it here, I'm sorry. In the lab, we do have a villager larva slice, and they look like a bivalve, okay? Small version of a bivalve, okay? And that's what they are saying, say foot, shell, it's all in there. Some cephalopods and bivalves have no free swimming larva. Here is the uh, trochophore larva uh, of uh, some species, and you can see the cilia in the middle, and uh, so on and so forth. This is a village here. Uh, you can see it, uh, but the slides we have, the microscopic slides we have in the lab, is nothing look like this. Okay. So uh, when we talked about the annelids, it was worm-like, segmented. You remember that? And each segment, you had repeated units and so on and so forth. So that was general characteristics of the annelids. If somebody asks you what is general characteristics of mollusks, well, we do not have one. But this diagram, this picture here, comes closest to having a general diagram of mollusks, okay? Because mollusks, you have organisms like uh, snail, one shell, univalve, and then you have clam, two shells, and then you have octopus. They, how, how in the world they look alike, okay? But you look at the um, annelids, you have earthworm, you have the narrow spherinus, clam worm, and you have leech. They're all pretty much worm like. Okay, so that's why I say there is no a good diagram shape of mollusks, but this, is, this comes close to it. Okay. So let's go over it. I'd like to go over every part. Here's the mouth in general. They have radula, the conveyor belt. And then underneath of the shell, they have a mantle, which secretes the shell. They have digestive glands. They have stomach. They have gonads. They have intestine. They have a heart, which is open end. You guys see that? It's not a closed end. And then you have coelom, around the heart there is a pericardium. So that pericardium, 
outside, it came from uh, mesoderm, pericardium mesoderm, and then you have coelom, and the heart is came from mesoderm too. Then you have nephridia, the kidney. You have the shell, of course, underneath is a mantle. It secretes the shell. And then you have the gills. And then you have the mantle cavity right here. Is a mantle, anus is right here. So the waste product from digestive system comes to mantle cavity. Of course, the, it goes out as well, but it can be there. The reproductive material, they did not show it to you guys. Oh, I do not have reproductive gonads. The gonads right here. They end up right here. The gonad material, the kidney material, they all end up into the mantle cavity. And there was a statement in your notes that I talked about that. Okay, what is this one? Uh, foot, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Uh, foot uh, secretes mucus for adhesion and slime and uh, the three layers of the shell, uh, periostracum, prismatic, and necklace layer. Yeah, 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 we talked about those, all of that. The first class, class monoplacophora, uh, placo, it means like a shell, like a, uh, something flat, okay? Um, mono, it means one, and uh, for a long time, they thought the organisms of this phylum are extinct, but they found them in uh, uh, Costa Rica, the coasts of Costa Rica, and they are not extinct anymore. So they found them, and they look like very, very old mollusks. So they thought to be extinct, and then small round shell creeping uh, for organs are serially repeated. Um, I said at the beginning, there is no metamerism, but since uh, these are uh, kind of uh, animals that the organs can be repeated, uh, they're not, the rest of the phylum is nothing like that. And just some of, uh, some of the species here. And here they are, <clears throat> pictures of a monoplacophora from your textbook. And um, that's all I have to say about monoplacophora. Class polyplacophora, uh, we do have specimen of this uh, in the lab. So the male shell, common name is male shell or um, chitin, uh, chitins or male shells, uh, and flattened dorsal ventrally have eight valves, eight plates in the back in the shell. If you look at the shell, you will see that there are eight shells, eight valves. And I'll show you some pictures in a minute. Uh, water can go through uh, pallial grooves through the gills. Do not worry about that. Some sense organs, mantle grooves, and heart has three chambers. A pair of metanephridia, trochophore, but not pelagia. Here they are. That's what I meant by HL. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. So there are eight of them in there, and that's what they call HL. Next class, class scaphopoda and classed like a scaffold. Uh, so it's a ladder-like, and then um, common name, tusk shell or tooth shell. We do have specimen of this in the lab as well. Uh, foot uh, into sand and shell and uh, in, into the water. Cilia extends from uh, tentacles of the, uh, of the head, which is called capitulum. Uh, capitula, we will see it in a minute. Uh, Radula cavity, uh, food in crushing gizzard. Sex is separate, and there is a trochophore larva. Here it is, the diagram. If you look at the head of the animal, right here is in the sand, and the end, the posterior end of the animal is in the water, okay? So you have mantle and gonads, digestive glands, kidney, none of these you have to worry about. Uh, but one term that I would like you to know is uh, capaticula, right here. Capaticula has, um, cilia at the end of them. And the cilia, the function is they sense the environment there. Remember, they're in the sand, okay? So this is all sandy area around the sand and they can detect food and they grab the foot, uh, the, the food and bring it to the mouth area. Okay, it borrows into soft mud and sands and feeds on by means of uh, 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 prehensile, tactile, capaticula, okay, internal anatomy of the interior. Okay, what uh, another interesting thing about these organisms, the American Indians, 
uh, they used to have these shells on the West Coast. I'm talking about uh, Washington, Oregon coasts, and the American Indians uh, used to grab these and then use them for uh, money uh, purposes. So if you want my horse, you have to give me four uh, tusk shell. So I give you four, and if I want on your bow and arrow, I give you two shell. Okay, that's what it had monetary value for American Indian on the west coast of the United States. Okay, class Gastropoda, um, largest class helix is the garden snail, uh, limpet, uh, abalone. These are uh, one shell organisms and the largest class within this phylum, the phylum um, mollusca, remember that that's the second largest phylum. Uh, but uh, this is the largest class within the second largest phylum in animal kingdom. I hope I'm making sense. Univalve, it means they have one valve. Uh, by valve, are, they have two valves, but these guys are not. Apex is the oldest portion of the shell, and I'll show you where the apex. Whorl uh, is a, each ring, okay? It's called the whorl. Columnula is that line. You will see some pictures of it right in the middle of the shell. That's called columnula, okay? And then you have dext uh, dextral and sinestral shell, and I show you, and I will talk about it. Sinestral shell it goes counterclockwise, and dextral shells goes clockwise. Okay, based on the um, uh, aperture. Aperture is the opening. Aperture is the opening of the shell. Okay, and then operculum is a flap, is the mantle skin portion. Uh, and which covers the, um, not all species have operculum. Uh, it covers the, uh, the, the, uh, the aperture. Okay, here we go. That, you remember I talked about the shell that has a line, it goes right in the middle. They cut this shell in half, okay? So when they cut it in half, uh, we have some of them in the lab. Of course, you don't have a picture of them yet. But uh, when they cut it in half, you see that uh, uh, columnula right in the middle. And then you have the, here's a columnula, a uh, whorl is one complete ring. One, two, three, four, five. This is the apex right here. That's an apex. This is the apex, the oldest portion of the shell. Okay. And uh, body whorl aperture, the opening, you remember that? Inner lip, outer lip, do not worry about those. Uh, siphonal canal, uh, don't worry about that. Not all of them have it, okay? Here is the shell, sinestral shell. This is a sinestral shell, and this is dextral shell. And how do you know? Okay, so if you have the aperture here, right? And you're looking at the shell, and the aperture is facing you, and then if you look at the world, right here, it starts from here. And it's going, um, it's going clockwise. I said it uh, by mistake during lecture. So it is going clockwise. That's a sinistral shell, very rare. In the modern nature, you find these shells, but they're very rare. Okay, in the laboratory, you can manipulate the genes and the, 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 the animal will make you a sinistral shell. Okay, dextral shell, on the other hand, they, if you open up the aperture right here is the aperture, okay? And you look at the world, look, the world goes this way, right? Since the world goes that way, counterclockwise, this is a dextral shell, very common. A lot of dextral shell in mother nature. Okay, so uh, you will see those. Uh, torsion is the you know the uh, twisting and turning of the internal of the visceral portion of the animal is called uh, torsion. Of course, in class we are talking about class gastropoda. You guys remember that? So oh, I hope I'm stuck again. Oh, no. Here we go. Only in gastropoda happens torsion, and scientists are baffled, are still thinking about it. Why? 
uh, evolution, uh, Mother Nature decided to do this. Why we are going to moving the mantle and twisting the visceral organs 90 to 180 degree and it happens in village stage and anus opens above the mouth. That's called fouling. You have no other species that the, um, uh, the anus and mouth are on, on the same region. We had other species, they had the mouth and anus were the same place, but these animals, they have complete digestive system. Think about it. They have complete digestive system and the mouth and anus are next to each other. And they call that fouling, okay? So why is that? Of course, your textbook and um, some scientists uh, elaborate on it and they talked about it. It doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> Uh, I guess, but you can read your textbook and say why torsion occurred, what are the advantages of torsion? Uh, maybe still these animals are going through evolution and they're gonna fix it, something happens, and, but uh, at this moment, uh, the anus opens up on top, of, on top of the mouth and that's called, uh, of course, that's not called torsion. Uh, the, the twisting of the visceral mass is called torsion. Okay, what is this? The arrangement resulting from torsion creates fouling. Oh, I talked about that, very good. Where a wastes are being washed back uh, over the gills it seems to be uh, counterintuitive in the nature and it has many implications and consequences uh, uh, for the snails. Okay, coiling is different than torsion. Coiling is when the shell spins around, okay, as they age, of course, the apex is the oldest portion of this shell, and as the animal is aging, so they can, they make it uh, bigger and bigger. Uh, spiral winding may occur during the larval stages, and uh, plant cipara and early gastropods is a subclass of gastropods. Coiling or spiral winding of the shell and visceral mass is not the same thing as torsion. Yeah, okay, so this is the diagram showing you guys, uh, you know, the um, coiling and torsion of these animals. Three subclasses of gastropoda, do not worry about them. Uh, Prosobranchia, uh, marine snails, periwinkles, horse uh, conch, and then uh, opistobranchia, which is the sea slugs, sea hares, and sea butterflies, and uh, palmonota, which is helix, uh, helix, the, the garden snail, uh, limax, and Picea. Um, someone student one semester was arguing with me that helix is not a garden snail. Uh, garden snail, well, based on my resources and your textbook, helix is the garden snail. Um, but anyhow, um, that's what it is. Okay, <laughs> I don't know. You want to argue with me or not? Anyhow. Um, some uh, snail serves as intermediate hosts as many parasites. We talked about that in the past. Uh, Fasciola hepatica, you remember that? That uh, liver fluke, not human liver fluke, but it's a, in ruminant animals. Uh, Physelia was the name of a, a snail, are often harmed by larval stage during infestation. Again, during infection, uh, so the larval stages harm the snail as well. Okay, class uh, bivalvia pelicipoda, another name for class uh, bivalvia is pelicipoda, and the common name for the class is hatcherfoot. Okay, um, a fresh uh, water mussel, hatchetfoot, and I gotta go, uh, clams, scallops, and some of the species, a shipworm, and then we do have all of them in the lab, clams, scallops, uh, oyster, uh, shipworms, they're all, we do have all of those specimens. Oops, sorry. Uh, all of those ones. No head, no redula, very little cephalization, if you would, and open circulatory system, of course. Uh, hemocyanin is a pigment uh, in uh, colorless uh, blood, which is acting like a, uh, acting like a white blood cells, which comes in uh, and scoop up the bacteria and unwanted uh, organisms, structures, whatever you have in the blood. Nephridia near the heart, the kidney. Uh, there is a comment, there is a question, of course, 
um, students ask, what is the difference between muscle and calf? Literally, really, really, really nothing. Uh, but some people like to refer to them as muscle. And then I got this from internet. The term muscle is used for several families of the bivalvia mollusks, inhibiting lakes, rivers, and creeks, as well as uh, in the tidal areas along coastlines worldwide. So literally, uh, the taxonomic groups, including most bivalves referred to as uh, clouds. Shell, they have two shells, hinge ligaments, which connects the hinge ligament is right here. So they connect the two uh, shells together. Anterior and posterior adductor muscles. I'll show you some pictures in a minute. And they work antagonistically. Uh, for example, this one, the, the, you know, the adductor muscles in here, for example, in here, works opposite of the one in here. So they work antagonistically. If this one contracts the muscle inside, not the shell, the muscle inside. If it contracts, this one relaxes. Okay, so. That's pretty much what antagonistically means. Umbo is the oldest portion of the shell. In gastropoda, you had apex. The layers of the shell, you already talked about that, periostracum, prismatic layer, and necrid. The PowerPoints comes up when the slide comes up. Uh, Malagrina, Rina, Malagrina is the name of the Japanese pearl production. They have pearl farms, you know, they put them in cages, and I will talk about how they make pearl in a minute. Hang on. But the name of the genus is that. Okay. Oh, even this doesn't work. Ah. Okay. Oh, great. Uh, body mantle, foot is attached to visceral mass. Yes, the edge of the mantle folds are modified to form excurrent and incurrent openings. Locomotion, blood is pumped into the foot and clapping their, uh, oh, sorry, let's go. So these guys move, they move, the bivalves move very slowly. Okay, as you know. One way, if this is the, the bivalves, and my, this, my hand right here is the foot, and the, imagine there is a shell here, okay? So what happens, they pump the blood into the foot like this, and then they push on the dirt, which is underneath. They push on the dirt and sand, and they make it straight, and that's how they move, okay? Very slowly. The other way is by clapping their valves, they, when they're in danger, when uh, a sea star, they love to eat them, a starfish, sea star, uh, they love uh, bivalves. So when they come to, the, to them to eat them, they can open up their valves like this and press the water out and escape from the starfish. Okay, so they can uh, move this way, but they cannot move this way all day long. Just very rarely, they're running away from a predator, they can clap their uh, valves. But, but they do move by they're pumping the blood into the foot, okay, and move. Okay, this is the pearl production. I would like to talk about it. Um, if you would, my pen, I lost it. No, it's right here. So if you look at it, this is the shell right here. And then you have the mantle right here. So what they come, they call this nucleation, and they studied this, they researched this very much. They came, uh, scientists, they came and put a little bit of a mantle from another organism in here. The mantle from another organism, it seems to give the best, purest pearl, even though it's a farm raised pearl and uh, it's not supposed to be as expensive. And the way the pearl, like diamonds, they reflect light, then they identify them, they are expensive. Okay. So then the, uh, the, 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 the oyster, the animal starts making the pearl right here and becomes bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, okay? 
So that is how pearl is formed. So the question is, where is pearl is formed? It's between mantle and shell. Okay, so that's where pearl is formed, not between uh, mantle and this is a visceral mass. You remember that? So I think, uh, if you go back to your uh, models and slides and you will see. So here is showing you the periostracum, prismatic, uh, the shell, and then uh, nacreous layer, and so on and so forth. Outside of nacreous layer, the mantle is being, uh, uh, the uh, pearl is being uh, made. That's about it. Okay, then as I said, the name of the process is nucleation. The best method is inserting mantle from another oyster. Okay, and then you had this in the last PowerPoints famous. So nucleation is not in your textbook, but I would like you to know that. It's the name of the process of making um, uh, pearl. Okay, so this is the gross anatomy, uh, big picture of uh, of the. Um, Bivalves. So these, this is the mouth right here, and this is the palp for sensing the environment. This is your hatchet foot right here. That's your hatchet foot. Okay. Of course, this is the shell. Uh, this is the mantle. All of that area is mantle. And then uh, these animals, um, X current flow, in current flow, in current siphon, they can gobble up water with the food in here. And it goes through the gills, and then either through the gills, the waste material can come out, to stuff that the animal does not want to eat, uh, and also through the excurrent siphon. Okay, so if you grab a, on the bottom picture here, if you grab a uh, clam and dissect it, open it up, for example, this is the foot right here, you put the knife uh, or scalpel right here and cut it longitudinally and you open it up and you see the parts. So this is the diagram, they open it up and inside of the foot, you see the intestine wiggles back and forth and outside of the foot, all of this is going out. Everything in there is going out. Here is the adductor muscles. Here are adductor muscles as well. Here is adductor muscle, okay? And here's another adductor muscle. So this one is called posterior adductor muscle this one is called anterior adductor muscle. Why? Because mouth is here. Since mouth is here, this would be anterior. Since anus is here, that would be posterior. Posterior, anterior toward the head. Okay, and then again, they do not have a head, just based on the mouth. They say what is anterior, posterior. And then of course you have the digestive glands or stomach right here. Uh, the heart, pericardium, right here, and the blood vessels, of course, is open circulatory system. Anterior aorta, uh, genital port, do not worry about that. Nephridia, the kidney, is on the bottom of the heart, okay? Uh, pericardium, right, a sac around the heart. Articles, do not worry about that. Kidney, as I said, uh, posterior aorta, do not worry about that. Rectum, anus and then excurrent siphon and incurrent siphon. Um, again, that's a method of sucking in water. They can absorb food through their gills as well, incurrent siphon and the mouth. Okay, and incurrent siphon, right, uh, and mental, so I talked about everything. Here's a cross section of it. You do have microscopic slide of this. On top is heart. And then what happens, intestine passes right through the heart. Very unusual in animal kingdom, that the intestine passes through the heart, okay? So intestine is going through the heart. And then of course you have pericardium outside here, you have kidneys on the bottom, and then you have two layers of gills, two layers of gills, and you have the foot. Inside of the foot, you have the intestine right here, and then you have the gonad. All of this is gone. 
Then you have the mantle, the shell, and that's about it, incoherent and excoherent cycle. Okay. Do not worry about afferent vessels, efferent vessels, and all of that. I'm not too crazy about those. You cannot see it. Uh, He says rectum goes through the heart. It's not rectum, it's actually the intestine going through the heart. What happened with at the turn of the century by 1900, when we human learn uh, for our clothing, we have button, right? Sometimes, let me see, like this one, oh great. Can you guys see this? Why he has um, uh, brown and white? Why they don't make it solid white or solid brown? Why they have, have you ever asked you that? You've seen buttons? I don't know, you notice buttons. Why are your kids ask you, why daddy? Why do they have brown? And of course it's made up of plastic. But what happened at the turn of the century, uh, they used shells of the clams on Mississippi River for making buttons, okay? Whoever came up with the idea of button, before then there was no button uh, but anyhow, by 1900, I don't know, those are your to design. Look up when the button came about. They were not plastics. So they made button from uh, shells. And then I've seen some pictures. I wish I could find them. There were uh, shells of clams as big as this room, bigger than a room. And the guy was standing next to it. Is the, and the rest was shell of clams. So when they saw the, uh, the uh, shells of the, uh, of the clams in general in Mississippi River is being wiped out, literally, they said no more. Uh, they passed a lot, so you cannot take the shells of the clams to make a uh, button anymore. And also at the turn of the century, you know, the acid uh, from the, the waste products from the factories they were dumped into the rivers and they, it, was, it made the rivers acidic. So it eroded away the periostracum, the protein coat outside of the shell and the animals were dying. The, the bivalves were dying. So it was a double whammy on the population of the mollusks. Uh, they came back, you know, they stopped both of them. Uh, you cannot dump your waste material into the river anymore. And then of course you cannot harvest these guys in massive numbers on Mississippi River. So they use it for uh, button industry. Here they are, some more pictures of button uh, they're making uh, from reproduction. Again, uh, this is um, trucophore uh, larva. They can attach the gills and they eat up uh, glutidium, I'm sorry, glutidium larva are specialized villager that attach the gills of passing fishes and where they uh, briefly as, act as a parasite to complete their development, they suck blood and then and they let it go. Sex separates, embryo, trochophore larva, virgin larva, fertilization internal, eggs and larva found in uh, marsupium. Of the, when I took zoology last century, what happened, they, 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 the clams they brought us to dissect, when we open it up, uh, in the gills, they were, uh, they were some youngs, okay? In the gills of, and that was interesting. But right now, um, all your dissecting, I never since I've been teaching zoology, I've never seen uh, the um, gills have uh, youngs in the gills, but that's what they are. Eggs and laurel found in marsupium of the gills as a part of the gill, anyhow. Okay, I'll stop. Here we go. So the other organisms feeding is a shipworm. And what happens, uh, they call it shipworm, it's actually bivalve that attach to the uh, ships and eat the wood of the, uh, of the sheep. And I think that's what they call it, a shipworms. Uh, Torito, Torito is the name of the genus and species. Of course, as you all know, this line should not be there. So anyhow. Uh, and sometimes they call it termite of the sea. But nowadays, the boats and ships are not made up of wood. They are made of fiberglass and they put special coating outside and they are not 
as much as a pest as barnacles. Okay, barnacles are a pest, but not these guys. Okay, symbiotic uh, with bacteria to digest cellulose. So the bacteria that is that is found in the gut, uh, it breaks down with the help of enzyme cellulase. Uh, it breaks down uh, the cellulose they eat from the oh, sorry. Uh, bacteria has the enzyme cellulose, yes. Uh, right here is a shipworm again. Um, class of Palopoda, the last class that we are going to discuss. Um, again, as far as intelligence goes, they are the most intelligent um, invertebrates, number one. Number two, they are the largest invertebrates on land. Okay, so uh, squids, octopus, nautilus, devilfish, cuttlefish, they are all uh, belong to the class of Palopoda. All marine, all predators, uh, all of the members of this class are, are marine and they are predators. Modified foot in the head regions. Um, Archaeotheus is the scientific name of giant squid, the name of the genus, of course. Some do not have shell and some have a poison glands like squids, octopus. Inside mouth, they have chitinous beaks. So these beaks inside of the mouth, it crushes uh, their predators and uh, it's made up of chitin. You all know what chitin means, it's a sugar molecule, and that's an nitrogen attached to it. Uh, foot is, uh, is merged with the head region and modified for uh, expelling water from the mental cavity. Nautilus uh, shell is uh, divided by septa. As you can see in the pictures uh, we have in the lab, make sure you can identify the septa. But all of these septa are con connected together by siphuncles. So the septa of the shell of the uh, nautilus, they are connected together uh, by a little opening from one septum to the next septum to the next septum. It's called siphuncles. Um, squids have pen. Uh, again, it's an internal pen. is an internal shell of these organisms called the pen. Octopus do not have shell. And they have two eyes. Uh, the eyes can form image, you remember that? In squids, two long tentacles and four pair arms. And the arms have suckers in both squids and um, octopus. And on the surface, uh, they have chromator of uh, chromatophores. At the beginning of semester, when I was talking about skin, I, I threw you these terms that made up of the um, um, pyrimidine, and then uh, what happens, they can change their uh, camouflage themselves based on the environment. If the environment is green, it is amazing, still scientists do not understand this perfectly, uh, but I'm sure the Army and Navy and Air Force would love to have something like that. They can, uh, the soldiers can camouflage themselves based on the environment they take location at. So um, these animals are able to do that. Okay. And then, of course, they have chromatophore. And I'm not surprised if Army, Navy, they're not working on this. Uh, they're using a lot of discoveries. They use animal models. They're learning now. We humans are learning to use animals as a model to come up with uh, what we want. Okay. So um, before it was not like that. Now it's uh, we more more and more look into animals. Here's a nautilus, and what else do you want? Do I want to know um, the shell, the septums? I showed you the chambers between the septums, and they're connected together by siphuncles. And the rest of internal an anatomies, I don't expect you to know those. Um, just the tentacles right here, the tentacles right here. Oh. The tentacles right here and the septum, we talked about that, and siphuncles, it connects them together. Okay. And these are ancient uh, body chambers of the old uh, extinct nautilus, and then we can read at the bottom. Uh, locomotion. Not found in octopus. That's another difference. Ink sac. They uh, 
they release the ink sac. Uh, we have not seen any other species from cinnamon sponges. They have a bad smell um, to repel the predators, but these guys, uh, they release ink. You've seen it in movies, I don't know, cartoons, and so on and so forth. They release ink, so they make the environment cloudy so they can run away. Uh, no cilia on the gills, a closed circulatory system, you already know that. Reproduction, uh, sexes are separate, and uh, seminal vesicles store spermatozoa, and Hector Cataleus uh, found in male is one of the arms of the male that reaches the female and transfers sperm to the female, and that's called, um, and I'm sure in this diagram, that would be the male Hector Cataleus. Uh, and that's in my sign of mail. <laughs> How do you like that? Uh, of course, you don't all know what I mean, mail. Mail is drawn like that. Male has the pointer, female do not have the pointer. Okay. Easy to distinguish those two. Eggs, uh, eggs fertilize in the oviduct, and malacology, it means study of mollusks. That's the end of the material for this exam, you guys. Um, I hope uh, if you have any question, the next thing I need to record is the lab material uh, for this exam. And I will do that and I will post it sometime soon. All right, guys. That's the end of the material for exam number uh, four. Yeah, arthropod is number five.